Welcome back, everyone. Or should I say, what's up, people? Because this is the first episode that kicks things off with one of my favorite OPs of all time. Like, I've loved this song since I was 14, jamming out to it on my Nokia 6085. Cringe, I know, but you get the point. I can't say that I'm typically into music like this, but this song, plus Attack on Titans and the Rumbling, are just, I don't know, they just do something for me. But I digress. Anyway, episode 20, Makeshift. So the episode picks up immediately after the last one, with the task force tuning in to the Yotsuba group's latest secret meeting. For a second, I thought it might be a different meeting, given the fact that after Oe says, Let's begin tonight's meeting. Light responds with, there's supposed to be eight of them, but only seven are present. Which is different from the last episode where the chief is the one to immediately respond after they start the meeting. But if there's supposed to be eight, why are there only seven? It's not a big deal or anything. It really doesn't matter at all, if I'm being honest. It's just kind of weird to switch who says it between episodes like that. But whatever. There's supposed to be eight of them, but only seven are present. That must mean that... They probably killed one of their members. What you talking about, Ryuzaki? Like, couldn't they just be busy this week? Or, like, out of town on business or something? Or, hell, just out sick? I mean, don't get me wrong, they're right, but it just seems a little odd to immediately jump to the idea of them killing a member of their own group. I mean, these are all high-ranking individuals in this company. Doesn't it stand to reason that it's more likely that one of them had urgent business elsewhere that needed tending to, as opposed to them just randomly killing one of their own members? In order to further the growth of the Yotsuba group and best serve its financial interests, who should we kill next? It's interesting that Oe is the one who always seems to start these meetings off. It kind of makes you wonder how he wound up in that position, and it also kind of lends itself to the idea that he might very well be the one with the notebook. I mean, if he's leading the meeting, then that could suggest that he was the one who called them all together in the first place. But in a moment, we'll see why that's likely not the case. This is not good at this rate. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Before we get to that, there are several topics that we need to discuss. First, there is the issue of Hattori's death. So right off the bat, we're going to tackle the elephant in the room, which seems appropriate. Let's see what they have to say. That was unavoidable. To be honest, in a certain sense, I'm relieved that Hattori's dead. Kira has demonstrated that we must be committed. We now know what will happen if we try to leave. So this was smart, really smart, actually. And I say that because we really have no reason to believe that Namikawa is the one with the notebook. I say that because he's not the individual who called out Hattori in the last episode, nor is he the one who was speaking knowledgeably about accidental deaths back in episode 18. So if we're working under the assumption that he's not Kira, then him saying this is really smart. For starters, by proactively saying that Kira's unilateral decision to kill Hattori was the right thing to do, he's putting himself in Kira's good graces. Namikawa may have liked Hattori, and he may have hated to see him die, but there'd be no benefit in making that known. If anything, like I said previously, it would likely only serve to be detrimental to him. If he had said that he was upset about it or angry that Hattori was dead, that would only serve to potentially make Kira weary about whether or not he'd retaliate in some way. Therefore, whether he means it or not, by saying that it was unavoidable and that he even feels relieved that he's gone, it's the perfect way to secure his position and stay in Kira's good graces. And secondly, the added bit about staying committed and knowing what will happen if any of them fall out of line acts as a kind of subtle reminder or warning to his fellow hostages like, hey, I don't want to see any of y'all end up like Hattori, so don't fuck up. <laughs> I think we all understand what Hattori's death means for the rest of us. Let's not take it lightly. So I wanted to point out this response from Oe because earlier I made the comments about him possibly being the one with the notebook, given the fact that he leads these meetings. However, I feel like this reaction makes it seem less likely that he is. Now, the most obvious thing I could point to would be him saying the rest of us, which would imply that he's also at risk of being killed himself. But personally, what stood out the most to me is the first part of what he says, specifically that slight pause at the beginning of a sentence. I think we all understand. And I know it really isn't saying much, but as my mom Mom told me a lot growing up, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And to me, it's that slight pause that says a lot. And what makes it especially poignant is the fact that Oe is indifferent for the most part. Everything he says is monotone and devoid of any emotion, except for this one instance, this quick moment wherein he laments the death of his coworker. But in saying that, I am also taking into account that he's not the one who threatened Hattori or made the comments about accidental deaths. Now, moving on. One of their members just died and that's all they're going to say. So my initial thought was, 
what are you expecting them to say exactly? Are they supposed to sit around and share stories or something? But then I realized these dudes are cops. The death of another cop is felt throughout a department, whether you were close with that officer or not. So with that in mind, I could understand how the chief might have that initial reaction to them being relatively nonchalant about the whole thing. Also, the task force isn't yet aware of the fact that six of these dudes are essentially at the mercy of Kida, and as such, they can't afford to be emotional about any of this, whether they want to or not. Overt displays of emotion in this environment will put you on the fast track to the afterlife. Anyway, one of the members comments on the fact that they paid Eraldo Coyle $5 million and he's yet to provide them with L's name or face. Which, I mean, my guy, you only hired the dude about a week ago. Like, you expect him to find out L's identity that quickly? Like, come on, man. There is something very interesting in the last part of this report. It says, the concentration of killings that are beneficial to Yotsubo will likely be noticed by L if they continue on Fridays and Saturdays. So that was pretty smart. Like at first I thought it was weird letting them know that someone had caught on to them, but now that they have cameras in here, there's really no harm in doing it. If anything, providing them with that information could potentially help to bolster their case because it might prompt these guys to deviate from their current pattern. And that would only further prove that they are, in fact, working with Kira. Then there's the added benefit of showing them just how good Coil is. I admit it's quite impressive. Which will make them all the more likely to continue working with him. And an added benefit of that is that they can keep inadvertently funding this investigation into them. Anyway, the task force is kind of in awe with how openly they're discussing it all, which prompts the chief to say, with this video evidence, they could arrest them immediately if they wanted to, which then prompts this line from Ryuzaki. This is not good. Which is now the second time he said that, but we'll get to why in just a moment. Kira hasn't been flexible up till now, has he? It would be nice if he could spread out his killings over the whole week. Now, I want to point out that this was said by Kida, and at first, I thought it was smart of him to say this, because it's the first time he's explicitly mentioned Kida without making any assumptions about what Kida could or would do. But then I realized that this actually wasn't really all that smart at all, at least not with the way that he went about it. You see, remember how Namikawa made a point to proactively support Kira's decision to kill Hattori, even going as far as to say that he felt relieved about it? Well, compare that to what this dude just said, calling Kira inflexible, criticizing his modus operandi. And sure, I'll admit that it's a small criticism, but it doesn't change the fact that it's weird to criticize Kira at all. Like, think about it. If you were being held hostage by a dude who, as you've now seen, is more than willing to kill someone for speaking out of turn, would you really think that was a smart thing to do? Like, dude even has his hands up while speaking, like, what's up with that? And honestly, in retrospect, Kira's body language in comparison to the rest of them also serves to set him apart from the others. But I'll get more into that in the next video. Anyway, it's made even more obvious how weird that energy is when the dude after him, Mido, just doesn't acknowledge the comments about Kira at all, instead focusing on the topic of Coil picking up on their behavior. Like, no one else ever engages in this kind of rhetoric in regard to Kira, which is the smart thing to do. The only one who'd feel comfortable doing that is Kira. And look, I get what Kira was trying to accomplish with this, but still, he was better off just staying quiet. Saying shit like this just makes it more and more obvious that he's Kira. But anyway, Mido suggests that they tread lightly going forward, which then leads into the meeting proper. Now, on to the main topic. Who should we kill? And it's interesting because this is the first time we get to see them really dive into their decision-making process. For example, Mido says that they should kill individuals from a rival insurance company. If they expand into the Japanese market, Yotsuba and many other companies will lose valuable clients to them. Which is interesting because it implies that Yotsuba is itself an insurance company. Any objections to killing these people from ELF with accidental deaths? No, no objections. objections. So I could see how it could be a bit jarring to hear them casually discussing killing people, which is why I like the fact that Light and his father are so shocked to hear it. What's also interesting and not even remotely surprising is the fact that Ryuzaki doesn't seem phased at all. But yeah, the meeting continues in this fashion as different members present their cases for why they ought to get rid of specific people. And as they lay it all out, it becomes increasingly clear that all of the task force's theories were correct. Deaths by accident, by disease, designated times of death, it's all just as we suspected. And yeah, everything y'all thought Kira can do, he can. And it's wild how matter-of-factly this information was presented to them. These dudes are just unwittingly laying it all out for them. However, while Light sees this as an absolute win for them, Ryuzaki doesn't quite agree, claiming that they can only actually be sure that any of this is true after these individuals are dead. 
If we can confirm the connection between their plans and the deaths, then we'll definitely be able to catch Kira. And he's right. As it stands, all of this is speculative at best. Sure, it's not a great look, and one could definitely make the argument that you have enough to arrest, but what are you going to actually charge them with? Murder? I mean, no one's died yet. Attempted murder? For what? Saying that you want them dead? Conspiracy to commit a murder? Maybe? I mean, my whole thing is, if you can't find proof that they've actually hired someone to do it, in this case, Kira, or that they intend on going out and doing it themselves, then, I mean, what do you really have here? Even the idea of conspiracy to commit a murder just doesn't make much sense because this is a world where people are posting online about wanting Kira to kill people. So it seems like a weak case to try and hold them for that unless they're also just arresting everyone who talks about wanting Kira to kill someone for them. Like, is this girl from episode 2 in jail right now or what? And hell, even their discussion about Hattori is going to be hard to pursue legally because all anyone really spoke about was being glad that he was gone. If anything, they could claim to be victims based on what Nami Kai and Oe said about what would happen to them if they failed to obey Kid as well. Now, if the task force had managed to record the meeting before this one, then yeah, they'd have someone on tape threatening Hattori only for him to then die shortly after. Hell, now that I think about it, that would have been the ideal situation because as fucked up as it is, I imagine the task force would be more on board with that than what Ryuzaki is suggesting. Speaking of which, after Ryuzaki says this, the chief and light chime in and, as you might imagine, Ryuzaki's suggestion of waiting to see if these people die doesn't quite sit right with them. Ryuzaki! Uh, oh. I can't carry on knowing these people will die. That's just immoral. Right. And yeah, they're not big fans of the idea and, I mean, for obvious reasons, sanctity of life and all that good stuff, but it presents quite the ethical quagmire because i mean while they are right from a moral or ethical standpoint i don't know if they're right from a legal one but let's hear them out it's obvious that these seven men are behind the killings with matsuda's testimony and this footage we've recorded we have all the evidence while that sounds nice what you actually have is jack shit and ryuzaki says as much when he tells them that acting now would be an absolute loss and i agree with him but we'll have to continue this conversation in a minute because while the task force was discussing this Oe mentioned killing someone as early as this weekend, and seeing how these meetings take place on Friday nights, that means the individual in question could be dead as soon as tomorrow, which prompts the chief to suggest calling one of the Yotsuba members immediately and telling them to stop with their planning. Which, while noble, just doesn't seem like the best plan, my guy. And Ryuzaki says as much, listing out three reasons why it would be a bad idea. For starters, it would screw them over surveillance-wise, since these guys would immediately know that they were being watched during this meeting. Secondly, it would screw them over with what they have going on with Eraldo Coil, because these guys would definitely think it's a little odd that all of this happened immediately after they started working with him. And lastly, if they act now, they'll have practically no way of figuring out which of these men is Kira. It's already taken months to get to this point, so to fuck it up now just, I mean, is it really worth it? Anyway, with Ryuzaki having laid out the consequences for calling, Light decides to chime in, claiming that instead of just calling one of them at random like the chief had suggested doing, he instead wants to focus on guessing which of these men is least likely to be Kira and calling them. He goes on to say, Ryuzaki, I'm going to pose as L. Judging from their conversation so far, the one least likely to be Kira but with the most influence is... Namikawa. Oh, Matsuda. Though, you know what, I can kind of understand why he said that. I feel like Matsuda was only half listening to what Light said, because, I mean, if you're going by who you think has the most influence, then yeah, Oe seems like the right choice. I would have agreed with him because Oe is the one leading the meeting, which would suggest that he has a great deal of influence. However, because he's leading the meeting, it also makes him more likely to be Kira. And you might be thinking, didn't he just say that he didn't think Oe is Kira? And you would be right, but that was an assumption I made based on having seen how Oe's interacted with the group in previous meetings. The task force is going based on what they're seeing right here, right now, in real time, so they can't factor that into their decision making process the way that I did. Anyway, if it's not Oe, then that leaves three other options for people who have spoken during this meeting. There's the guy who is Kira, who was outwardly criticizing Kira for only killing on the weekend. Not only was he ignored by the others, suggesting a lack of influence, but he's also the one who made the comment earlier about Coyle not finding anything in his investigation, only to then be corrected by Oe when he responded with, Hold on a second. There is something very interesting in the last part of this report. So, not only does Kira not have influence, but he also seems somewhat incompetent, having missed that crucial piece of information from the report. So, moving on from him, there's Mito, who commented on Coyle being clever, and suggested that they kill the people from ELF Insurance. He 
definitely has influence, as they all agreed with the research that he presented. But the fact that he suggested killing someone at all would mean that there's a higher likelihood that he himself is Kira. Which leaves Namikawa, who was the first person to speak up about Hattori, and as I went over, his comments felt more like a legitimate warning rather than an outright threat. He also has enough influence that Oi, the guy with the most influence, openly agreed with his sentiment. So yeah, based on the four people that have spoken, I would agree that Namikawa makes the most sense. But anyway, Light makes the call. Is this Reiji Namikawa? Yes. And who is this? Listen carefully. I am L. Light then goes on to lay it all out for our boy Namikawa, making it clear that he's been listening in by going over everything that had been discussed during the meeting thus far. And <laughs> Namikawa looks a little stressed, but something I really want to point out is that here we see Namikawa get his own color, in the same vein as some of the other characters. I spoke about Matsuda joining the Pallet Gang in the previous episode, and now Namikawa is part of it too. And as some of you pointed out in the comment section, Misa is also a part of this particular crew, though her color scheme is a bit harder to really speak to. Especially especially since she seems to have different colors depending on the scene. And interestingly enough, something I noticed in going back to the older episodes is the fact that blue doesn't even originally belong to L, since the first time that motif was used was with Naomi, not Ryuzaki. But I intend on doing a deeper analysis of all the different colors in a future video, as there are a few that have yet to be introduced and I don't want to get ahead of myself. However, that being said, let's talk about Namikawa for a second because Honestly, purple is the perfect choice given the situation he finds himself in. Now, the Kiddas, L slash Naomi, and Matsuda all have primary colors red, blue, and yellow, respectively, but Namikawa does not. Now, we could just say that that's a result of there only being three primary colors, so by process of elimination, he'd have to be given a secondary one, but I feel like it's actually a lot deeper than that based on what Light tells him next. If you are not Kira, let's make a deal. If I win against Kira, you will be acquitted of all charges. If Kira wins, then you'll be free to carry on with your comfortable life. Just play along with both parties. And this is why giving Namikawa that color makes so much sense. Because what two colors do you need to create purple? Red and blue. The two colors that represent Kira and L, the duo that Namikawa now finds himself stuck in the middle of, forced to play both sides simultaneously. It's actually kind of brilliant, and I really love the way they chose to represent that dichotomy within Namikawa. Also, shout out to my wife for introducing me to color theory a while back, because I probably wouldn't have even thought to mention this otherwise. So yeah, love you baby. Anyway, as far as the requirements for the aforementioned deal, Light tells Namikawa that he has to delay the deaths of everyone they've spoken about in this meeting by a month. Also, the whole thing about the charges being acquitted, well, that not only goes for him, but everyone attending the meeting who isn't Kira. The way Light puts it, they'll acquit them based on the premise that Kira blackmailed you into participating in these meetings. Which is technically true, right? I mean, how were they ever supposed to say no to Kira once he brought them in? Like, legitimately, I would really love to see how that very first meeting went down with all eight of them. Like, I imagine they all showed up and were pretty confused. Like, did you call this meeting? Did you? Did you? Did you? I imagine it was incredibly awkward and just weird. But yeah, Namikawa agrees and not missing a beat, immediately gets to work convincing the group that they need to hold off for a month. And he really doesn't get that much pushback. And that makes sense. They were already skeptical about continuing at their usual schedule anyway, given what Coyle had written about in his report. So Namikawa suggesting that they hold off, especially given his influence, it makes sense that they would just go along with it. And yeah, after that, the meeting promptly ends and we turn our focus back to the task force. You really are quite amazing, Light. At this rate, if I end up dying somehow, it's quite possible that you would be capable of succeeding me. Oh geez, what a compliment. I mean, it's a little weird to just randomly start talking about himself dying, but I mean, it is Rizaki, so a little weirdness is to be expected. But I mean, still, that's a hell of a compliment. He must really think highly of Light. Regardless, Light tells him to stop being so morbid and to focus on the investigation. But Rizaki ain't letting it go, claiming that on top of stopping the killings and securing Namikawa as a potential mole, he was also the one to originally uncover the connection between Yotsuba and Kira. In short, he's killing it. Uh, <laughs> figuratively, of course. And so Rizaki decides to just outright ask him. If I should die... Would you take over for me as hell? An interesting question for sure. I mean, he's right, Light is more than capable. He's really kind of been the driving force behind the investigation since he was brought on, remaining steadfast and persistent with the goal of catching Kira, even when Ryuzaki just wasn't really feeling it. I mean, would Light be willing to take on the mantle if something were to happen to Ryuzaki? Would he want that kind of responsibility? Well, I guess we'll find out in a minute, but for now, <laughs> welcome back to How to Use It. 
First up, if written the same name on more than two death notes is completed with a 0.06 second difference, it is regarded as simultaneous. The fuck did I just read? Hold up. If written the same name on more than two death notes is completed with a 0.06 second difference, it is regarded as simultaneous. The death note will not take effect and the individual written will not die. So first off, what the fuck is that sentence? Like I'm not usually one to be a stickler for grammar, but that sentence is, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know. Like it's so weird because none of the other 38 rules we've covered are written in this sort of broken English. But whatever, the message basically states that if two individuals write the same name down within 0.06 seconds, then that death will be invalid. And I imagine this rule is more so for Shinigami than it is for humans, because there'd be no reason to void out the death if two humans happen to want the same person dead at the same time. But if two Shinigami were trying to siphon the lifespan from the same person, I could see why that would warrant it being voided out as not to double dip, per se. It actually kind of aligns with the rule that we covered in the previous episode with the whole first come, first serve thing that I mentioned. But you know what? If I could digress for just a second, this rule made me randomly think about Misa and how it's just super weird that none of the gods of death in the Shinigami realm have written her name down because, like, she's a whale. Like, her lifespan is super long in comparison to most people because of what happened with Jealous. He'd accidentally extended it well beyond its natural end. Like, it made sense for them to not write her name down when she was being guarded or possessed by Rem, but she's on her own now. She's fair game now, right? Like, I get why it doesn't happen, narratively speaking, but, like, realistically, one of those Shinigami should have definitely written her name down. Anyway, next up, the god of death must at least own one death note. That death note must never be lent to or written on by a human. So, uh, I guess I was wrong in my video for episode 12 when I accused Rim of lying when Misa said, Each Shinigami has to have one death note of their own. For a Shinigami to give a notebook to a human, he needs to have two. That first sentence was damn near verbatim to what this rule says, so apparently Rim was about her shit and I was wrong. So, sorry Rim, your boy fucked up. However, that being said, that's cap, or at least it really feels like it is because to me, the fact that the rule states that the death note must never be lent to or written on by a human implies that if that does happen, there would be some sort of punishment or consequence. Now, this rule doesn't apply to Rim or Ryuk because they've held on to their original notebooks and Jealous is dead, so technically he's not a part of this discussion either. However, the same can't be said for the original owner of the death note that Ryuk dropped because, well, not to spoil too much, but that Shinigami isn't dead. So if that Shinigami is never supposed to have a human writing their notebook, then, I mean, <laughs> what's the punishment here? What are their consequences for having had this happen? I would imagine that it would be the fact that said Shinigami would be stuck with whatever human picked it up until they died, but, I mean, it's been like a year and that Shinigami hasn't even showed up. And don't even get me started on any hypothetical time jumps that may or may not happen during the story. It's just weird, because why state that they're never supposed to do something if there's no actual repercussions for doing said thing? It just seems kind of pointless, but whatever. We head back to the task force where Ryuzaki's question is still lingering in the air like one of my farts after a burrito bowl from Chipotle. If he is Kira and just playing innocent, he's sure to say yes. Ah, so it is indeed another test, which I don't really blame him for. Hell, if anything, Light proactively saying that he'd take on the role of L for that call was a little weird. Or rather, it would have been if Light was still Kira. In this instance, Light was just trying to come up with the best possible solution in the moment. It's actually wild because, like I said earlier, Light has been the driving force of the investigation since he was brought back on after being locked up. And I could see how that might look a little suspicious to Ryuzaki. Like, he's really out here getting shit done, and one could argue that the reason he's doing so well is because he's the one who set this shit up. And, <laughs> I mean, it both is and is not true. Like, yes, he is the one who set this whole thing in motion, but at the same time, he has no memory of that. Everything he's doing right now is just based on who he is as a person without the Death Note. But yeah, all that aside, this test makes sense. However, Light's quick to catch on to what's happening here, and what's even more interesting is how he chooses to respond to it. Ryuzaki, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to tell 
everyone what you're really thinking right now. And the reason I say it's interesting is because, historically speaking, that's not what the old light would have done. There have been multiple instances where Ryuzaki has tried testing light, but light has never just outright called him out for it, instead opting to play along. Which I guess kind of goes to show you the difference between Kira light and innocent light. This version of light feels like he has nothing to hide, and so he doesn't. There's no reason to keep secrets from the group. He's not trying to play some sort of cat and mouse game with Ryuzaki anymore the way he did when he was Kira. This guy's just trying to prove that he's innocent and catch the real Kira. So I like the clear difference in how he responds to Ryuzaki's test, now in comparison to how he did then. But anyway, Light goes on to lay it all out for the group. He thinks that if I am Kira, then there are two possibilities. The first is that he's just pretending not to be Kira, which is what Ryuzaki was testing right now. And the second being that he really did lose all of his memories regarding being Kira, with the caveat being that he did so intentionally, in such a way that he could set it up so that the power of Kira will one day return to him. And he's right, Ryuzaki even thinks as much to himself. Impressive, he figured out exactly what I've been thinking all this time. And it's funny because Ryuzaki is also right, because that's exactly what Light has done here. But yeah. Taking on the identity of L, having the power to control the police in every country, while being Kira in secret, it's ideal. He says menacingly, like damn Light, you're not doing yourself any favors sounding like that. But also, controlling the police in every country? Like my guy, they were prepared to kill this man a few months ago. I'd hardly call that control. But I get what you're trying to say and it really would be the ideal situation overall. Anyway, with Ryuzaki confirming that this is his theory, Light goes on to say that he doesn't want the title of L, which he thinks, in turn, should convince Ryuzaki that he's not Kira. However, Ryuzaki retorts by saying that there's no way he'd actually just come out and say it now, which I mean, Fair, but understandably, this frustrates Light a little bit, making it feel as though he just can't win either way, but ultimately it culminates in Light firmly putting his hand on Ryuzaki's shoulder, spinning him around, getting down to his level so that they're staring each other in the eyes and saying, Do you think that I'm actually capable of becoming a murderer? And this feels real. I mean, it is real. He's legitimately asking this man if he really believes that he's capable of something so monstrous, so despicable, so evil. Light knows that he's not capable of doing that, and so it's difficult for him to reconcile with the fact that this man, of whom he greatly respects, thinks so negatively of him that he believes that he's capable of mass murder on an unprecedented scale. And you might think, given his earnest delivery of that question, that maybe Ryuzaki might take pause and ponder on whether or not Light really is Kira. That is, until you remember this is Ryuzaki that we're talking about, and so... Yes, you do. I've always thought so. Well, damn, never one to mince words, are we, buddy? Anyway, the response leads to another quick brawl that ultimately ends in another stalemate with Matsuda, once again, jumping in to break it up. Also, Mogi is here, and I didn't even realize it. Like, he hasn't spoken this entire time, and he doesn't for the rest of the episode. His ability to blend into the background is honestly next level. Out here giving Drax a run for his money. Anyway, the boys get past their little scuffle, and the chief chimes in with, We have plenty of footage from this meeting. Can't we use that as evidence and prevent the murders of other criminals? Which, as we've been over, that really isn't the ideal thing to do, as noble or honorable as it might seem. But Rizaki brings up another good point, for why they shouldn't act now, stating that, as far as they know, Kira isn't one of the seven men. I mean, we know he is because the group confirmed it when they were introduced back in episode 17. No matter how you look at it, one of the people in this room has to be Kira. But the task force wasn't privy to that information, and so they have to at least consider the fact that Kira may not actually be in that room. Therefore, acting now could result in all of the Yotsuba members being killed and Kira once again being in the wind. Now, the chief pushes back on this, claiming that the inverse of that theory is just as likely, and Light agrees with that sentiment. And, to be fair, they are right. Kira is among them, so arresting them would actually put an end to the killings. However, in that instance, you still run into the same problem I mentioned earlier, which is, what are you going to actually charge them with that can hold up in court? Even if other criminals stop dying, you run into the same issue you had incarcerating Light and Misa. It doesn't actually prove anything. There's also no telling whether or not it would even change anything because Rim could very well just take the notebook to someone else immediately after they apprehend Yotsuba Kira, thus starting the cycle all over again.
But y'all know where I stand, and with that being said, I legitimately want to know what y'all think. If you were on this investigation, how would you proceed with this? Omitting the fact that we all know that Kira is amongst these guys at Yotsuba, would you side with Team Yagami, meaning you would use the footage obtained during this meeting to proceed with arresting them immediately? Or are you Team Ryuzaki, meaning you would wait for one of their victims to die so that you could have actual proof of what they've done? I'm actually going to go ahead and take advantage of the community tab for this one and create a poll. So be sure to look out for that after this video. And if you feel like it, you can explain why you chose Team Yagami or Team Ryuzaki. But let me know what y'all think. I look forward to reading your responses in the comment section. Anyway, Ryuzaki, apparently fed up with the back and forth on the matter, says, Excuse me, but I think from now on I should go after Kira by myself. Which is an interesting claim to make. But he goes on to explain that if they continue working together, it's only going to cause more discord, and he'd rather avoid that. He basically tells them that if the feeling moves them, then they should feel inclined to act however they wish, but he doesn't want anything to do with their process anymore. And if they are going to arrest those men, then they'll have to deal with the consequences of that, i.e. the possibility of Kida getting away. Basically, his main thing is, This case will never be solved unless we capture Kira himself. It's not that he's against saving lives, but he also understands that this won't ever truly stop until they capture Kida and figure out exactly how he's doing what he's doing. If they're not willing to do whatever it takes to get that information, more people will ultimately end up dying in the long run. It'll just be an endless cycle of getting close to Kida, only to lose him all over again. All the while, he'll just keep racking up more and more kills. But yeah, with that being said, he gets up and heads to Misa's room. Unfortunately for Light, due to the two of them being chained together, he has no choice other than to join Ryuzaki on this expedition, despite disagreeing with his plan of action. The two make it to Misa's room where she's reading what I believe to be a manga. I can't make out what it is exactly. I thought it might be the Death Note manga because that would be kind of funny, but honestly, there's no way to tell for sure. But yeah, Ryuzaki wastes no time and jumps right into things. Misa Amane, <laughs> tell me, do you love light from the bottom of your heart? When she responds with the obvious answer of, Of course I do. He then questions her about her feelings towards Kida, and her answer to that is obviously that she worships him. Now, none of this is all that surprising or even new information, but where things get interesting is when Ryuzaki ask her how she feels about Light wanting to catch Kida, to which she says, Well, if that's what Light says, then I'm gonna support him no matter what. This then opens the door for Ryuzaki to use Misa the way he wanted Light to do in episodes 18 and 19, as he offers her the opportunity to help Light in his goal of catching Kida. And she's all for it, though the same can't be said for Light as he was obviously adamant about not wanting to manipulate her feelings for him like that. Though, interestingly enough, in the last episode, it was implied that he did end up manipulating her when Ryuzaki said, We won't be able to do it without Misa's help. She'll listen to you and do anything you say, won't she? And she did end up going along with what they had planned, but then there's also the fact that she had a lot to gain from helping Matsuda anyway. I mean, she was excited as hell when Matsuda told her that she might get the opportunity to be their spokesperson. What? For real? You're amazing! So if we factor that into things, one could make the argument that Light didn't manipulate her feelings in that situation, and instead she did it because it could have worked out in her favor. Hell, now that I think about it, the last thing she tells the Yotsuba group as they're leaving implies as much. Just don't forget about me for your next campaign, okay? So yeah, I'm assuming it didn't take too much convincing to get her to do that. But regardless, I actually really like that upon splitting from the rest of the task force, Ryuzaki stopped caring about anyone else's feelings. It's clear that he'd been wanting to use her from the start, but instead chose to be respectful full of what the task force, or I guess more specifically, what Light wanted. But now that he's not beholden to them anymore, he's doing whatever the fuck he wants. And that means putting Misa to work, regardless of how Light feels about it. He goes on to explain that he wants to use Eraldo Coil to pump information into the Yotsuba group about Misa possibly knowing what Elle looks like by revealing to them that she was previously apprehended under the suspicion that she might be the second Kira. Rizaki believes that the opportunity to potentially get information on Elle's identity will prompt them to bring her in and question her about what happened. And it won't even look that suspicious or random given they've already been in contact regarding her being their spokesperson thanks to Matsuda. And <laughs> speaking of which, she's going to be the spokesperson for an insurance company? Eh, now that I think about it, weirder things have happened. Anyway, after Ryuzaki lays it all out for them, Light vehemently opposes it. This plan is too risky. Who knows what could happen to you? And, I mean, he has a point. It's kind of fucked up, really, because she, I mean, like, 
she's kind of dumb. I mean, I know she has her moments where her intelligence shines through, but more often than not, she behaves pretty stupidly, especially when it concerns her feelings for Light, so I could understand why he's concerned. And it doesn't even really have to do with him liking her or having feelings for her or whatever. I mean, he's concerned about the deaths of random company officials, so if he's that worried about them, then it only makes sense he would be concerned about this woman that he actually has a semi sort of relationship with. Regardless, Misa ain't afraid of no kidda. She's got this. No problemo! I promise I won't say anything, even if they torture me. I can attest to that. He's out of line, but he's right. I mean, real talk, he's got a point. Him just casually throwing it out there like it's no big deal is a little out of pocket, but it doesn't change the fact that he's right. Misa ain't gonna sell any of y'all out if that's not what Light wants. However, Light does bring up a really good counter argument saying that Kidda can control a person's actions before death, meaning theoretically, Kidda could just manipulate her into giving him all the information he wants before killing her. And he's right. It's been confirmed by the Yotsuba group that they 100% have the ability to control a person's actions before death. It's not speculation anymore, it's a fact. And hell, we know that the death note can very much be used to make a person unwittingly write down people's names because we saw it done back in episode 5, which means that Matsuda, Mogi, the Chief, and Light would all be fucked because Misa knows all of their names since they've stopped using aliases around her. However, that being said, Ryuzaki counters that by finally taking Light's advice from episode 18 and invoking some of that good old positivity, claiming that Misa will only die if they lose, and since they don't plan on losing, everything will work out just fine. Which I mean, sure buddy. Either we lose and both die together, or we successfully catch Kira. Which is it? We catch Kira! It's so wild the way he's just wrapping her around his finger like this. Like Light is trying his best to get her to understand how risky this all is, but Ryuzaki is just playing her like a fiddle. I would never dream about living in a world without Light. Yes, that would be dark. Fucking Ryuzaki, man. This guy is just fucking silly. But I could totally understand why this would frustrate Light, and believe me, it definitely is. Cut it out! This is just crazy! But Ryuzaki does not stop the manipulation there, instead dialing it up to 11 by saying, I've turned to her because I know her bravery and love for you is boundless. Misa is indisputably the most perfect and worthy woman for life. And even the delivery of that last part was just hammy as fuck. And like any good piece of ham, Misa ate that shit right up. Do you really mean it? I think I've totally misunderstood you all this time. <laughs> You're such a sweetie. Misa, you do realize this is the guy who put in the order for you to be tortured for days on end. You you do remember that, right? Like I just okay, you know what, fuck it, whatever. You do you, Queen. Yeah. I could actually fall for you. I honestly feel confident in saying, if given the opportunity, under vastly different circumstances, Ryuzaki would totally smash, which is funny because Light just isn't even remotely tempted to do anything, despite her figuratively and shit quite literally throwing herself at him. Anyway, Misa spurns Ryuzaki's advances, claiming that they can be friends, adding, And of course, I would never think of betraying any of my friends. Oh, is that so? Huh. And this friend you made the tapes with, where is she now? Why are you doing this to me? If you want me to kill her, just say so and I'll kill her. Okay, Misa, whatever you say. With our powers combined, We'll arrest Kira. Light's taking a different investigative approach from us. Huh? What's up with that? Come on, El. Now you're just playing dirty. Dirty as fuck. And look at his fucking face. He's just a troll. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude is just the worst, and honestly, I'm all for it. So now, pressured by both Ryuzaki and Misa, Light has no choice but to begrudgingly join their side, which is just <laughs> fucking Ryuzaki, man. My boy's out here making shit happen. And it doesn't even stop there, because as Misa goes on to profess her undying love for Light, Matsuda and Mogi watch it all play out from the lobby as the chief sits in the corner saying, Figuring out the logistics of arresting seven people is going to be challenging. Which is pretty much meant to imply that they're not going to be able to handle all of this without help from Ryuzaki and Light. Meaning Ryuzaki, in the span of about six minutes, has corralled the whole damn group into doing exactly what he wants. And yeah, I guess the last thing I want to point out before we wrap this bad boy up is the interesting way in which this episode played out. Because it did something that no other episode has done thus far. Wherein everything we just saw happened in real time. And what I mean by that is there are no breaks during any of this. No moments where we cut away and an indeterminate amount of time passes. Everything is happening as it occurs. We start off with the Yotsuba meeting, they talk about Hattori, they decide who they're going to kill, Light makes the call to Namikawa, Nami 
Arakawa convinces them to hold off for a month. The Yotsuba meeting then promptly ends, which is immediately followed up with Ryuzaki trying to test light. This then leads to the two of them getting into a little scuffle. The task force continues their conversation about how they want to handle things going forward. Ryuzaki decides he's going to go off and do his own thing. He immediately heads to Misa's room with light. Misa then decides to help with the investigation as the other members of the task force come to the realization that they're going to have to stick with Ryuzaki. And then the episode ends. <laughs> All of those events happened one after the other with no time in between, and there's actually no other episode like this, at least thus far. Most episodes span a couple of days, or in some cases, a month or so. The only one that comes close is episode 7 with Naomi, but even that one has some minor time jumps as we switch back and forth between Light and Naomi and the original Task Force. But everything that happened in this episode seemed to take place in no more than half an hour. I thought that was actually super interesting, and I think it's part of the reason this particular video is so... So damn long in comparison to the others. There are no inconsequential moments, and as such, I didn't feel comfortable leaving anything out. But yeah, with all of that being said, roll credits. Anyway, that's the end of this episode. If you liked this video, then consider dropping a like, and if you really liked it, then consider subscribing. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, friends, peace.